Okay. Hello, thank you for coming to watch us tonight. Uh, we have Michael Kors from Ridgewood Water, the business manager who's going to tell us more about how we can meet this month's sustainability challenge, which is to conserve water. We'll explain how Ridgewood gets its water and a few other neighboring municipalities and what we can do to uh, conserve this pretty much precious, scarce, and irreplaceable resource. Hello everybody, thank you for uh, joining us out there. Um, I actually want to start off today by thanking you for taking the time to look at this presentation and to hear some of the pointers we have to say, because truthfully, water conservation is one of the most community efforts that could be possible. Uh, none of the things that we can present or ask you to do are possible without you taking the action. So thank you for taking the time and uh, look forward to responding to any questions that may come up. Today we're going to kind of focus in on a couple of resources that are developing out there for water conservation. These things that the NJDEP has put together. They've got a great website in order to guide us along to some of the uh, tips, tricks, and tools that will help us be better at water conservation. Um, then I'm going to go through some of those tips and have them available for you all to view. So. I find myself to be a an interesting thing with water conservation. I've been in the water industry for 10 years, and in all honesty, for the first probably eight of them, I couldn't understand why in the Northeast we talk so much about water conservation myself. So I find myself a born again uh, water conservationist. Really, coming to Ridgewood is what taught me about why, even though we may have a plentiful resource here compared to, say, Arizona or Colorado. There's still many great reasons to save, even just beyond the idea of sustainability or the idea of uh, environmentalism. And to give a little onus with that, I put this slide up uh, from our budget presentation this year because, you know, as a water company, uh, our business model is based off the product of the water you guys consume. Uh, and as you see in this chart here, um, this is the breakdown of what we call our fixed charges, our PFAS charges, and our volumetric. Of course, our volumetric charges are what's associated with how much water you guys actually consume. And here you'll see that 70% of our income, 70% of what we depend upon to balance our books and make sure our system is sustainably delivering water to you each and every year, comes from these charges, from uh, this volumetric and that consumption. So when it comes to when we're telling you to conserve water, you can know that uh, we're even acting against our best interests to a certain degree. So we hope you all take this seriously as we move along. So I wanted to bring everybody's attention to this website. Uh, this is our NJDEP's most recent conserved water page. There's a lot of resources available here, a lot of uh, tools, a lot of different programs that have developed over the years. I was very excited when I saw this, because we have spent as much time as we can on our website, but this is a really great resource for us all to use, and we are linking it to our website as well, in case you guys want to find a good way to find it. The biggest question that tends to emerge whenever we're talking about water is, why conserve in the first place? I think I saw some comments before this event started where people are saying, you know, we're in one of the rainiest states in the country. Why do we need to conserve water? There's some misconceptions that come along that line. So try to kind of clarify you know, what I had to learn myself by coming to Ridgewood Water. Uh, first of all, fresh water is a finite resource, meaning that we have a limited amount to use again and again. You know, water may be abundant around the world, but so much of it is filled with salt. So much of it is our seawater, and that's not portable drinking. When you look at the other side of this chart, you know, our water supply is critical to our economic future, our human health, and our safety. So making sure we have it available is as important as anything we do. In New Jersey, the real thing that we have to consider is our population density. 
You know, just uh, just because we have a plentiful amount of water um, doesn't mean we have that same amount of water for everything. Now, here in Bergen County, we have some of the most dense parts of the nation. To give an example of that, I wanted to tell um, the tale of two systems. I picked two systems to kind of compare to each other to better understand how this uh, population density will affect what we uh, have to undertake as a water system. And uh, when you think of water conservation, you think about how it affects the environment, you also have to think about what it costs to produce that water and what it costs to deliver that water to each of your homes. I grew up in Livingston, New Jersey, so I picked one near here in my heart. And uh, you know, to give it a little context, Livingston, New Jersey has a population of about 30,054 people across a footprint of 26 square miles. Ridgewood Water, which makes up a population of about 61,700, fits all those people within 17 square miles. In Livingston, that population density is about 1,000, 1,100, 1,200 per square mile. And they have nine wells that serve that population. Here in Ridgewood Water Service Area, that same, uh, that population density triples as we uh, look at the number of people fitting the same amount of space. And in order to meet that demand, we have 52 wells pumped. So consider that difference between those two very similar type of communities as far as uh, maybe you might consider MHI. But when you're looking at that, you know, the amount of infrastructure that we have here in order to address that is immense. And the funny thing is that the biggest problem that we have doesn't come from how much you drink or how much you shower. We actually say we triple the amount of water we have to produce from the winter to the summer months. And 90% of that comes from lawn watering and irrigation, landscape irrigation alone. So the biggest problem that we have, the biggest reason why we have to consider conserving doesn't even come from the amount of resource we have, but really what we do in order to make our lawns as green as possible. To explain this chart a little bit, you'll see uh, in the, at the lower part of the chart we have about, in the wintertime, we're averaging between three and five million gallons a day. When we bump up in the summertime, that bumps up from anywhere from 10 to 15 million gallons a day. We have allocation permits that allow about 18 million gallons a day, and our superintendent starts sweating on those days when we have about 15 million gallons a day coming through. Uh, he always says, uh, he said one really interesting thing to me last year. Uh, we don't necessarily have a supply issue. We have a distribution issue. And now keep in mind that Livingston has nine wells serving 26 square miles, where we have 52 wells feeding into 31 treatment plants. Add in the fact that our current endeavor is to centralize further into 12 PFAS treatment facilities. And that means we're making a, about $140 million investment, because in the summertime, we have triple consumption in order to water our lawns and feed our plants. And it becomes a question of whether you even need that much water to keep our homes out. So you consider when, where your bills are and what these charges add up to. It's all because we need 12 P, uh, PFAS treatment plants as opposed to eight or six PFAS treatment plants. We need 52 wells as opposed to 30 or 35 wells. That's all so that we can have that insatiable hung, hunger for that grass growing beneath our feet. Looking back at the site, a couple of other reasons why we want to conserve. Uh, an efficient use will save money, help protect the environment, and ensure the future of our water supply. The other thing to consider is efficient use in non-drought times may prevent the need for water restrictions during dry time. And I don't necessarily mean that from our supply, again, and that means from the health and vitality of the landscapes we're insatiably feeding with water. We're actually hurting our landscapes by giving it too much water. Even though it's green all the time, that lawn is not as resilient as it could be if 
we follow a few simple rules. And then on top of that, just like we see energy star systems, we have something called water sense right now, where many of our appliances and fixtures, our sinks, our uh, shower heads can be more efficient and help us save water by also uh, allowing us to get the same level of quality of service from that instrument or from our showers. So I brought up this website because I wanted to show you a great resource for yourselves. For any programs you might be developing, looking for information on your own, understand how to be better water conservationists, how to teach our next generation the importance of this resource, the NJDEP provides another great source. We also have some resources on our website under our water restrictions page. You're going to find a link to those resources, examples of our ordinances. You'll learn a little bit more about our smart controller program. Um, but this year, we're going to focus in on one area in particular. Uh, we have a goal for our water conservation program. Thank you guys for joining us today. Maybe a few more people will join us today. <laughs> so Ridgewood's Water Water Conservation Program, every year we try to spark off in March to remind us of the importance of what it takes to save water. And, uh, this year, in a few weeks, you're going to see this hit each of your mailboxes. Um, this year we're using an old term that just makes a whole lot of sense. Essentially, let's be water wise. The real initiative behind that is ensure that we have better water quality for our communities, ensuring that we can implement the PFAS operational strategy that we've been trying to deploy for the last few years while we bring on those uh, PFAS treatment plants. We also want to point to the importance of preparing your lawns for droughts and dry spells. Overwatering actually limits how deep those roots will grow, which makes that lawn weaker in case there's a disease that starts growing on it or we have a real dry spell, we get into that critical condition, we can't water at all. Finally, something that's really been a, a point of pride as I learn more and more about the history of Ridgewood Water and uh, the village of Ridgewood itself, but uh, essentially the, the goal to be New Jersey's water wise leaders, or it says wise water leaders. You know, we've already set an example for so many communities over the year I've been with the company, where they've come to us to learn more about the two-day water irrigation schedule that we have implemented. Um, and we should continue that trend, not only by being leaders ourselves, but also being leaders for our neighbors who might not understand the importance of this. This program has three goals. The first is to cut our outdoor use by about 20%. I'll tell you exactly what that means. It sounds like a lot, one-fifth of what we're dealing with. But really, 20% could be as simple as four minutes. We want to emphasize and help people understand the importance of following our irrigation rules and guidelines and what that means for ensuring that we're not only pulling from the best water sources we have at the moment and pulling the most from our P plus treatment plants as they come online, um, but also helping to make sure that uh, everybody has access to that water. And finally, we want to lead by example. My favorite conversations are with the people that call up angry about their neighbors that don't want to listen to our rules, don't want to listen to our suggestions. The passion they have behind their voice, and all I can say to them is thank you. So continue that trend. Work with your neighbors, educate them, help them understand the importance of leading by example and showing to the next generations why we need to save this finite resource. Now talking about that 20%, that can be as simple as thinking about how many minutes do I normally water my water? If I normally split on that sprinkler for 20 minutes, cut it down by four minutes, that's 20%. 20 divided by five equals four, four minutes, now you water for 16 minutes. Water for 16 minutes twice a week. You normally water for 30 minutes, well, 30 divided by five is six, cut down to 24 minutes. You like to take a uh, 10 minute shower, cut that down by two minutes, try to keep it at eight minutes. Simple things to get to 20% will save so much for you so much for us overall. Finally, take a look at our irrigation schedule and rules. Um, we're taking a little bit of a progressive approach, one that's being adopted by water systems around the country. Traditionally, we've always had an odd, even watering schedule, which means every other day. 
basically, you know, if you're odd, you do on the odd days of the month, or even you do it on the even days of the month. Well, that system has been proven to actually waste water and consume more water than you realize, even though you're implementing a restriction schedule to a degree. What's, really, what's starting to take over, and what a sustainable Jersey has modeled as a new approach, is a two-day water schedule. So essentially, on Sundays and Wednesdays, the even addresses. You know, if you have an even number in your house address, those are the days you water. On Tuesday and Saturday, that's when our out addresses water. On Monday and Friday, our, all of our municipal properties water. So you know, we split it up amongst weeks, we split it up in these different groups. Now we're taking the entire service area and divided that into a third watering on any given day. We take Thursday off, no long water by any of the entities whatsoever. So that's the idea of the two day long watering schedule that we have uh, been trying to implement. We appreciate all of you trying to uh, help us bring this as a new norm, not only in this community, not only in this service area, but everywhere across the state and across the country. What about commercial? Do they go by address? Generally, yes. Yeah, commercial is affected by address. I haven't thought about the commercial, <laughs> but I guess that's where it just fits in. So the three reasons that we want to water wisely um, are coming from the, you know, this idea of ensuring better quality water for our communities. This year we are aggressively putting all of the remaining PFAS treatment plants into construction. We have two up and running. We had another one that's scheduled to be outlined by August. We have a fourth already under construction, and the rest of them are in the process of going out the bid, all staying on schedule to be online by 2026. Problem is we have to get to 2026, and we can do that by conserving water. You know, there are varying degrees of PFAS in the wells across the service area, and with treatments coming online in different areas, we now have a choice to pull from there. The more we reduce and conserve water, the more we can choose which wells we turn on on any given day. And that's our PFAS operational strategy. Choosing the, to meet the demand by keeping the wells with a lower contamination and then turning off the ones that might have a higher levels in them. But we can't do that with their current demand. If everybody keeps turning on the water the way they have in the past, then we have to meet the demand in order to keep our tanks filled. Then prepare your lawns with uh, droughts and dry spells. Overwatering creates shallow root systems and invites invasive pests to come into your lawn. We have healthy lawn. A healthy lawn is going to have a lot of bugs in it. But all of a sudden you start seeing a lot of slugs. All of a sudden you start seeing a lot of mushrooms grow. That's because we're putting in way too much water. And that's actually damaging our lawn and inviting worse things in to make our lawns less green. And as we talked about being those water plastics. So I have a little demonstration I was going to try to put together on this little call out to any of you that visit our table on Super Science Saturday. Um, I'm going to put the computer down in a minute, but what I wanted to give a description of is um, how the water actually comes to us. Uh, we are a groundwater system. We are not fed by aquifers. We actually have a natural filtration that appears every day for us that works on our behalf to make sure it pulls that. Some of the debris, some of the dirt, some of the contaminants out before it actually reaches the aquifer that we pull it. What you see here in general is uh, the type of water table. Let's look at this chart at the very top here. You have your groundwater. One of the questions we always get is, we just got so much rain. Is that rain filling our aquifers? Is that rain replenishing it? The truth is, is no, because that rain is falling here, running down the ground, and then running out to the lake. Some of it is the ground, but usually we have that top little aquifer layer. We call it the unconfined aquifer that's under the influence of surface area. And then we have our confined aquifer, which is the lower one. And there's a clay shelf that actually can separate the two. And it could be multiple layers. So you have a confining bed, confining bed on the bottom water table. 
And our well usually goes somewhere in the middle, but it drops below where that actual, uh, where the surface water is. We have some estimates that with the high amount of rain we've been getting, when we have those deluges that come down, it actually washes, about 70% of that washes away into streams and rivers and doesn't affect our aquifer in any way, shape, or form. On top of that, you gotta think the aquifer we come from, that could be coming from 70 miles away. You know, we're a bedrock formation, so we don't have sandy soils where the water stays right here. We gotta dig into the fissures and that water could be traveling a long time. So what falls on the ground doesn't necessarily reflect what we have. So a little example of this, our, uh, our, our chief chemist, Alma, uh, put together a nice little demonstration for the students about two Saturdays back. I'm not sure how well this can be seen by the camera. Let me see, I'm just gonna head up for a minute. Yeah, I'm gonna have to do a close up, but what we have here is a, little microcosm of what you see up there. Different layers of fine sand and rock and dirt all leading up to a nice little mossy surface. And here I have some dirty water. A little muddy water just straight off out of the, probably straight out of the tap with a little dirt from the uh, garden in it. And this one actually has a chemis chemical indicator. Just a little food color. But what we're going to give an example of is um, how the water goes through our sandy soil and the fil natural filtration that comes from it, but also what doesn't get filtered out, which is some of those chemicals that can stay in the ground for a long time to come. So test number one, you have just our dirty water, praying it doesn't go fall everywhere. slowly filters through, you start seeing at the bottom there, nice clear water from this muddy muck that we see down to nice fresh clear water. So that's stage one of our filtration. The ground does it itself. You want to come on up? I don't know how well the camera picks it up. Can you tell? Is it nice and clear? You can see that, yeah. You can see? Uh -huh. Good, good, good. Now imagine a contaminant like PFAS. You know, sitting in the round water, it's a blue indicator. Now this has dirt in it as well. As that starts filtering through, can you see that little blue tint still in there? Groundwater will only filter out so much. It'll act as a natural uh, filter for us, but it won't necessarily take everything out of the water. Some pathogens will only last as long as some bacteria. I've heard uh, fecal bacteria can last about three days. So, you know, depending on how long it takes, that's why you don't have to worry so much about the fecal bacteria coming through to the bottom layer and us worrying about treatment for that. I mean, we do with our chlorine, we cover it anyway. So that's where we go to the next stage of filtration. And that's why we have all these treatment plants being built for. So after we put in our, um, after we get out, after the ground does the work to get out some of the more natural pathogens, we then take this and start running it through our uh, GAC vessels. And that's where we can start taking out those chemicals. So this is stage one. The world of Earth already does it for us. Stage two is why we're investing in this at the level we are right now. And GAC, what did that stand for? Uh, GAC stands for granular activated carbon. So if you, if you haven't heard, we're making a historic investment into this uh, system right now. We're isolating down to 31 treatment plants, down to 52 treatment, I'm sorry, down to 12 treatment plants, and each of those treatment plants acts as a point of entry into the distribution system. So we're going from 31, 31, right, Rich? 
31 all the way down to uh, 31 places where water enters the system and could be a source of contamination, down to 12 places that enter this treatment system. It gives us a lot more control now and for where it may come down into the future. So, Dad, I'm going to put this on a beautiful piano and hope that it just sits. It has a nice padded cover to it. Good, good, good. Coke bottles are only so stable. I don't know about anyone else, but I'm really thirsty. <laughs> <laughs> So I don't know if Facebook Lives allows us to feed questions. <laughs> I've been asking for if anyone has any questions, so please uh, post your questions in really any comment section of our, our Facebook, and we'll chat. The two-day irrigation, is that a suggestion, or is that like a law rule that you get that's articulated fine for the NASA? So that's a regulation that we have by ordinance, and we do have still certain, uh, a violation with that. You know, so we ask the people, you know, we generally give a warning for people that don't realize the schedule right off the bat, there could be a fine coming, you know. So we do have uh, an ordinance to provide a violation. And is it just based on you see the meter usage overnight, or you just by driving around and you see it? We actually have people driving around, you know. So we have a couple rules set aside for our, for our irrigation schedule, our long watering schedule. And you'll find them right here on our on our page, uh, just to kind of bring everywhere everyone to where that is. If you go to Ridgewood's Water website and you come over to Customer Information, we have this section called Water Restrictions. And each town is actually a, a somewhat of a historic moment for our system. We've done a lot in the last few years working with Wyckoff, Glen Rock, and uh, Midland Park and leadership, and rebuilding some of the relationship and communication. And it was one of the first times that all four counts came together and passed the same ordinance, making two-day water restrictions permanent across the whole service area. <clears throat> when you come to water restrictions, you'll get a, a whole breakdown of what we talked about, the odd even days, when you're allowed to water, when you're not supposed to water. Um, right here, we have a little bit of a chart summarizing the ordinances. And it breaks down everything from using a handheld held hose to uh, a hose with a portable sprinkler to if you have an in-ground sprinkler system, in-ground uh, trip irrigation, um, or if you apply for a smart exemption. Uh, we do have a program where we allow for smart controller exemptions, and the smart controller exemptions work with the weather channels and as well as rain sensors to know if there is rain coming or not. We're gonna watch a video in a little bit, and one of the things they say you only need one inch of water a week to keep a healthy lawn. And you actually get most of that from dew and rain. So people who are watering all the time don't realize that nature is already providing the water that those plants need, and you just need to add a little bit extra in order to get it over the hump of the dry season. <laughs> Here we allow handheld um, hose watering any day. You know, we do have a request where we try to focus. We get you not to water between 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. Because when you're talking about losing water, that's the time when you can lose water to evaporation. So you let that sun go a little bit lower, stay a little bit lower on the horizon on the other side, and you'll keep more of that water on your ground than you will if you do it in midday. For our automatic sprinkler systems, we, and particularly our smart controller exemptions, you're promising to only set those to run between 3 a.m. and 7 a.m. This does a couple of things. This means that your irrigation is pulling from the, uh, pulling from our system at a time when most people aren't showering, aren't bathing, aren't washing clothes, aren't drinking, they aren't cooking. And then that gives our operators time to refill the tanks by the time everybody wakes up and starts doing those things. Um, with smart controller exemptions, we offer the opportunity to water on any day. Smart, controller, smart controllers work with the weather to know when it's going to rain. So if it's a Sunday and that's your day and it's going to rain, you don't just lose your day. 
I mean, it'll recognize that you don't necessarily need more water because of how much water fell, and it'll be programmed, and if it operates properly, it'll water with that amount in mind. But it allows you water on those other days. So as mentioned with the violation of the best smart controller exemptions, our guys are trained to know and have a list of people that are pledging to follow these rules and work with us on this conservation. And then they won't see you watering on an off day and give a fine to your guys or you know, a warning more than likely. Yes? Could you give a sense, if you know offhand, of what are the biggest water uses or how much water is being used by all these everyday household functions? Like how much does the landscape water compare with the laundry, compare with the shower, compare with washing dishes? And like what are the biggest offenders and what aren't? So, um, there was a breakdown I saw where, you know, like a uh, we were saying we're asking for reduction in 20%. I've heard people say 30%. And generally what that means is 20% reduction of outdoor use and 10% indoor. Because the vast majority of the waste is coming from that outdoor use. And that's where it really comes down to. So that's where we are focusing our attention, because that's where the most control is. You know? Yes, can you take a short shower? Um, I invite you to grab one of our uh, on the, on the blue little disc back there is a shower timer. It is a five minute shower timer. You know, I am, uh, as I say, I'm a born again water conservationist and one of my biggest sins is that I am a 20 to 25 minute shower day. <laughs> now, I have been able to get down to two shakes of the shower timer. <laughs> it has a little section on the back. Yep. So you can have to flip it over another five minutes. So I try five minutes, I haven't gotten to five minutes, I might have gotten down to seven. But I'm better than I was because I have that shower time during my shower each and every day. So, what happens if you run out? Is the issue that you just try, like the aquifers get empty? Then it runs. One of the reasons I said I'm a, a born again water conservationist is I never understood how in the Northeast we push water conservation so much because truthfully we have a lot of water. You know, in Arizona that's an issue. In Colorado, they're sharing, the Colorado River has rules where Arizona and Nevada is pulling from it, so they have to have restrictions of that higher level. For us, what it really comes down to is our, um, it's, not, it's not only how much there is in there, there's always a risk of running out, but it's also how much it costs to get all this to your house. You know? we, we have seen evidence where we basically are tripling our water consumption in the service area, from the winter time when nobody's watering their lawns to the summertime when everybody's watering their lawns. And believe it or not, you think a pool might take a lot of water, but you fill your pool once, you refill it once or twice throughout the season. It's that every day or that every few days where everybody is running the water at the same time and draws the most down. So that's where the real issue comes from. And, what, and the bigger problem is um, the infrastructure it takes to deliver that. You know, if we are 5 million gallons a day in the winter and we're 15 million gallons a day in the summer, that means that two-thirds of our water, two-thirds of our infrastructure, two-thirds of the bill you're paying in order to get that infrastructure delivered to you is so that we can water our lawns. So if we can cut even that two-thirds down to one-third, the amount of savings that would happen overall is just a measure. That makes sense. What about the water treatment? I mean, those use a huge amount of power. That, that is the other side. If you're coming in from a strictly environmental standpoint and you just want to be good stewards of the environment, the amount of power we have to utilize to run all those plants, we have 12 tree, PFAS treatment plants. What if we only needed eight? You know, the amount of chlorine we have to add to it, and that then doubles it because it's not just on this side. You know, the sewer systems don't have meters. They actually run off of our meters. Whatever we do, like the sewer bill you get, is because the idea is if water comes in the shower and goes out to the drain, that's how much water they have to treat from your house. How much water goes in, technically, is how much goes out. Now, if you think about that, they have to treat all this sewer, this the sewage, to get it back to a place where they can enter it back into the environment. And how much energy do they use there? How many chemicals do you have to go through the treatment process? What is the infrastructure on that side? So it's a bit of a doubling effect, even beyond just our water treatment plants. But yes, you know, that's, that's some of the concerns. We could shrink down. We're spending $140 million to one-third of that, possibly getting drinking and showering 
where two thirds of that is creating an output thing. This is where I was going to get into the second part of the conversation of the presentation. There's no more questions. <laughs> what if they just raise the price on the water to just make it so discouraging to use it? Or like the first X number of gallons, you know, like an escalate, the first X number of gallons is cheap and then it really skyrockets on the rate. A tier based system. Yeah. We're considering it, we're looking into it. The thing is, we actually almost naturally have a tier based system. Now, we should have that idea where the, the biggest the users are somewhat paying more. Um, but one of the things that I brought up in that, my earlier slides, so this is from our project presentation. This is a breakdown of our current rate structure. When you're designing a rate structure, you think about your fixed expenses, you think about your variable expenses. We have our fixed, our volume is our variable. That means how much water is being consumed, how much is being charged at that rate. And then PFAS surcharge is something we've added um, as we're going through this big investment. And if we can recoup any of those funds from sources like governmental grants or from a lawsuit, then we can actually modify that PFAS surcharge accordingly. That's why we created it separate from our fixed charge. <clears throat> Even with those two charges, 70% of our revenue is already coming from volumetric charge. So because such a vast majority is coming from that volumetric charge, it's almost like a pseudo tier. We are thinking about it, we're looking into it, but we have some other challenges we need to invoke before we go down that road. You know, making sure we finish off this work by 2026 is primary right now. But it's a, uh, it, and you know, think further about this. I'm up here talking to you about using less water. I'm up here telling you to buy less from us, even though our entire business model is basically built on how much you buy from us. So, that puts it in context. Like a dentist telling you to brush your teeth. Right? What? <laughs> like a dentist telling you to brush your teeth. Exactly. Exactly. Any more questions? Uh, for later. For later. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> so water. Oh. So let's talk about the rest of the presentation. I want to talk over. Um, some tips, tricks, and tools that you have available to you to make better decisions. Because I don't want this to be hard. I don't want you to have to sit there and think about how to conserve water. I want it to be easy. That's why that 20% goal, and I can turn it on for four minutes less. Sure, you know? That's an easy one to absorb. And being good, mindful water conservationists and water stewards can take that little bit of thought. Just a little bit of practice and a small little light change, and all of a sudden, boom. Or a small little change on the dial of your automatic sprinkler, boom. You got to do the job. With that, I'm going to bring us to a couple of videos. Um, prior to you guys getting here, this was the MJDP site. They put together a really great site called Conserve Water. That's a lot of great information for you if you guys want to refer to it back at a different time. They have this nice little video about some of the areas. You know, here's some of the information about where you can add in low flow shower heads. You know, there's that take the five minute shower timer challenge. Um, and still low flow toilets. You turn off water while brushing your teeth. How many of us just let it run and run? And what's the point? So with that in mind, let's see what the DEP is providing for us. Throughout the state of New Jersey, Families just like yours are busy tending to their daily lives, making sure their children are comfortable, happy, and well-educated. And yes, unknowingly wasting thousands of gallons of water every year and can translate into hundreds of dollars of savings for them if they just make a few easy changes. But here in Egg Harbor Township lives a family that knows that saving water is saving money. They designed the interior of their home for maximum water savings by following the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's 2009 water set specifications for new single-family homes. And they also know that saving is easy, too, because it adds up when you follow a few simple water-saving tips. 
like using the water sense labeled products you can buy in the store, such as replacement toilets, shower heads, and bathroom faucets. There are also many water saving, high efficiency washers for clothes and dishes. Most can easily be replaced by the everyday do it yourself. Here are some tips for saving water and money in the bathroom. Update your shower with a low flow shower head. Cut down the time you spend in the shower to five minutes or switch from baths to five minute showers. Replace that old water hockey toilet with a water sense labeled model. Get your family to turn the water off while brushing their teeth in the morning and at night. And update your faucet or attach an inexpensive faucet aerator to your existing one. For the kitchen, only wash dishes when the dishwasher is full. Replace the old dishwasher with a new high efficiency model. Use a faucet aerator and change to a low flow faucet when possible. And store drinking water in the refrigerator instead of running the faucet until the water is cold. And in the laundry room, upgrade to a high efficiency clothes washer. Wash only four loads of clothing by adding until the washer is full. And adjust the water setting level to correspond with the size of the wash load. The few examples we mentioned add up to more than 172,000 gallons and up to $1,120 a year for a family of four to save and enjoy. So remember, saving water is saving money. It's as simple as that. Couple additional tools that we have available to us. Some of the additional tools that we have available to us. That one of the great things that we have developed as a water system is providing a family pledge for good water. Plans. On the back of the table, there you can grab one of the pledges. You can hide it on your. Um, Refrigerator, so that you can remember some of these tips. It's, it's a nice way to share as a family and to impart upon our children and next generation the importance of this and actually making that physical pledge. So we can do it throughout schools, we can do it with neighborhoods, we can do it within your friends' groups. But it's a nice little reminder of a step to go forward. The other day, the motivation to um, do a better job of understanding if you have a leak in your house. This is one of the things that uh, blew my mind in the last couple of weeks. It was a, a particular customer I was working with on another issue, and she called me up uh, because she got a $2,000 water bill. She got a $2,000 water bill because her toilet was running. Three gallons per minute, we see it all the time. People just aren't even aware of the fact that we have them. And they sit there and they just, uh, they, you know, running and running and running. You have a tenant. They don't tell you it's running. All of a sudden, a quarter goes by, two thousand dollars for you. Three hundred fifty-seven thousand gallons in a three-month period. As you said, buying those water sense um, products, you know, we all see the Energy Stars. I think we've all migrated to Energy Star. Water sense is the next thing to keep in mind. Now, keeping track of your water consumption um, is always very important. And we've developed a free and fairly quick tool to help you do that. Uh, we've contracted with a company that provides what is called WaterSmart. You can click on this QR code. Everybody already has an account set up for them. You just need to go in and log in. And you can get your monthly consumption shot right on your phone. It'll, you can set limits so that if you're exceeding your normal consumption or a certain amount of consumption that you plan to get to, it'll send you a notification. And it's a good indication of some of those leaks that can be costing you a lot of money in your house. <clears throat> on top of that, on um, the very tool that we have provided to 
figure out how much water you guys are using on a daily basis has a leak detection tool in it itself. We come over to our meter information page. We have a couple meters in the back you can take a look at to see exactly what we have right on the table by the shower timers. But on this page, it'll tell you the type of meter to look, meter to look at. But on the meter itself, it has a leak detection tool. This is our older meter. Um, there's actually more of a red dial on the meter that you'll see in the back. But you can see if you turn all of your water off and that dial is still moving, you know water is flowing somewhere. That means you have a faucet dripping. That means you have a toilet running. That means somewhere water is leaking. And heaven forbid, you may have water dripping in your wall somewhere. So that's one easy tool that's already in your house to determine if you might have a leak. There's a digital meter in the back there. So there's the two different versions. We have the analog. Um, I can talk about meter guys. They, they did analog. They actually went to digital. And then all the people wanted analog back. So now people have a different variety of which ones may be in their house. But um, in this option, there's actually something here that tells you. So you shine a light on this screen. This will be blank until you shine a light here. Um, and it'll open up. First, there'll be your meter reading, which will be a number that goes across the whole screen. Then there'll be this small meter that'll tell you actually in that gallons per minute if you have water going. So if you go with that meter, if you have a digital meter, and you look here, and this is running, and you swear you have everything closed off, it means you might have to leak something in your house. So there are tools all around you you can use in order to determine how to better save yourself money and save the environment as we go along. Now, as we spoke about, that's the 10% inside the house. What about that 20% outside the house? Throughout the state of New Jersey, families just like yours are busy caring for their lawns, gardens, and landscapes to enhance the beauty of their property. But unknowingly, they are wasting thousands of gallons of water every year that can translate into hundreds of dollars of savings for them if they just make a few easy changes. But this family in Ann Arbor Township knows that saving water is saving money. They have designed the exterior of their home for maximum water savings by following the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's 2009 Water Sense Specifications for New Single Family Homes. They know that saving is easy too because it adds up when you follow a few simple water saving tips that can help you cash in and have more money to enjoy with your family. Like the right watering techniques, a correct approach to gardening, a proper method for doing household chores, and a plan for smart recreational use are four key areas that can save you money while saving water. Let's get specific about watering. Only water when needed. New Jersey landscapes need approximately one inch of water a week, much of which often comes from natural rainfall. Water plows with rain collected from your roof using a barrel connected to your gutter downspout. Use 30 to 50% less water with drip irrigation and microsprays compared to sprinklers. A smart irrigation system that accounts for soil moisture before turning on. A rain sensor that avoids watering when sufficient rain has fallen. And sprinklers that produce droplets, not mist, that can more easily evaporate into the air. And if you have an irrigation system, get a system audit done by an irrigation professional who has partnered with WaterSense. Gardening techniques are also critical. Use native plants that survive best in local conditions and group plants together based on water need. Choose drought-tolerant grass varieties such as tall fescues. Mulch around trees and plants to reduce evaporation and water-consuming weeds. Cut back on lawn areas and increase the size of low water using and native plant garden beds. Chores around the home can save big too. When using a hose, Control the flow with an automatic shutoff nozzle. Raise your lawnmower blade to at least three inches to promote deeper roots and root system shade that holds soil moisture best. Don't over-fertilize lawns as they need more water to survive. Sweep driveways, patios, sidewalks, and steps rather than hosing them off. When it comes to recreation, avoid recreational toys that require a constant stream of water. If you have a pool, remember to purchase a water-saving filter and cover your pool to reduce evaporation when not in use. So, as we leave our water-efficient home,
problem here in Egg Harbor Township, remember, saving water is saving money. It's as simple as that. Once again, both of those videos are available at that DP Conserve Water website. Um, a couple things to talk about. One of the things no one ever thinks about is this idea of overwatering and what it does to your lawn. Yeah. Overwatering not only made spongy lawns, you know, footprints in the grass issues with the top of the grass itself, promotes the development and growth of weeds. You know, it creates runoff because that water just basically doesn't even absorb into your lawn, doesn't even get to your grass. It goes right into the street, right into a basin, right into a river. If you're ever seeing fungus grow, it means you're automatically you're, you're overwatering. Just cut back right away. Um, thatch, matted brown spots, you know, all these issues can arise from that process of overwatering. And then when it comes to bugs, remember bugs are a unique one. Bugs you don't want. You want some bugs. Healthy bugs, the right bugs, and I can't even tell you exactly which ones those are. But there are water friendly bugs, and there are bugs that you don't want, particularly grubs, you know, particularly slugs. If you're seeing a lot of that because you have way too much water, and it's promoting those coming into that environment. Don't fight the sun. Don't water during the day. Don't let half the water you're paying for evaporate into the mist of the atmosphere. Um, so. Not your lawn sprinklers, only before 10 a.m. or after 6. And all automatic irrigation systems should be set between 3 a.m. and 7 a.m. Finally, maintain your water system. These things leak all the time using plastic parts. My father-in-law's house, a guy put it in, and he put the one sprinkler right on the corner of the driveway. It's not even a brick. I'm terrified every time I pull out, I'm just going to run over it and break the whole thing. Half the time, it stays out of the ground. Finally, join our smart watering system. Join in our program, make that pledge to water according to the rules, but also have that smart control. And then display this. We give this placard to everybody who joins that program, because that's one of the ways you can lead your neighbors to know, I do it. Uh, there's a term I learned a long time ago called normative referencing. The idea that uh, they use it on utility bills, where they tell you the, um, how much your neighbor on one side is spending and how much your more expensive neighbor on the other side is spending. And it gives you an idea of where you could be worse and where you can be better. And you usually find a nice place in the middle to be. Or you shoot to be better than that one neighbor. Ten very simple steps to save water this summer. Flat water flowers and landscaping with water harvested in rain barrels. Meant to have a rain barrel here, unfortunately it's sitting in our hallway over in the uh, building next door. But getting a nice rain barrel and harvesting that and using that as opposed to irrigation system. You hook your hose right up to that, you get a drip hose and you let it slowly go out. Use 30 to 50 percent less water with the drip irrigation and micro spray and micro sprays compared to sprinklers. You guys familiar with drip irrigations? Wonderful tools, and all that water is really set to go into the ground. Only water when needed. In New Jersey, most landscapes need that one inch of water per week. And most of that comes from doing rainfall. Purchase that pool cover. Purchase that water saving filter. Avoid recreational toys that require a constant stream of water. A pool is a great example of one that doesn't. A lot of fun, and that water is in there and being reused again and again. This is one of my favorite ones. Raise your lawnmower blade to at least three inches. It not only promotes deeper roots, it not only promotes a healthier lawn, it also means you might only have to uh, mow your lawn once every two weeks. Remember, every day, every week, I have just that, you know, one Saturday to get a job done. I kept doing the same job, mowing my lawn. My, uh, my garage stayed dirty. <laughs> Clothes never got folded, but my lawn got moved. Break that, cut that down by half. 
Use water from dehumidifiers. If you check the dehumidification of your house, use that water to water your plants. You don't have to take it, throw it down the drain, take it and put it outside. Use native plants. Design your landscape around plants that should be in the ground here. They're better with the water, they're designed for the water that we provide. And then finally, group plants together based on the water needs. That way you're not watering something that doesn't need as much water as maybe the daisies that might need a lot more. With that, I can just say thank you for listening and trying to learn how to be more water wise. Questions? Thank you. It was what you said at the very end. So we do a lot of like kid sprinklers. Yes. Which um, I've always wondered, you know, do you have any rules of thumb for something that keeps that from sucking up? Because tons, like, is it if an hour too long? Is 10 minutes? Is, like, what is the. It's, uh, that's a hard one. Um, I think the only rule of thumb I can say is if you're using a manual sprinkler, like normally, um, to water your lawn, don't water your lawn one day with a manual sprinkler and the next day have your kids running through it. We do it in the driveway. Hmm? We do it in the driveway. Oh, and all that just runs right off into the street and into a store base. More like into the, it's sort of tilted back into the property, so it runs kind of back. Oh, that captures some of it. Yeah. At least it gets back into your yard when it does that way. Yeah. But I, I can't really say rule of thumb. I've heard that. The only rules I've heard is, unfortunately, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tough one, too. I have a two and four year old, and I want them running through a sprinkler myself. Exactly. But there are some other tricks. You know, there may be some toys that are coming out that recycle some water. Mm -hmm. So you might have a pump and a basin, and you might have, you know, you have a sprinkler where it's being caught and worked around. Water tables are great things. Yeah, yeah. Having them play in those water tables, that works well. Mm -hmm. Probably, you know, I mean, even the water guns, <laughs> even though we may not promote that, is a, a, a more finite amount of water than a sprinkler that is just running and running and running and running. Yeah. So unfortunately, I don't have a great answer for you. The only advice I've read is uh, stop doing it. Yeah. <laughs> or use the little kiddie pool, I guess. Yes, that works well. But then, I mean, they don't run through that sprinkler for that long when I it's yeah, maybe yeah. 10 minutes that they're like, no, 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 no. I, I look outside and no one's there. Right? Yeah. yeah. So I, I don't know. And I might recommend do it on the lawn. Set up in the driveway. Go to your lawn, you water your lawn at the same time they're having fun. So you're getting two things. Yeah. So if you don't, you might, we might forgive the, the time of the day. <laughs> yeah, we'll try not to restrict recreation. Yeah. We'll be able to create an you're right. <laughs> Leftover or uh, Patterson pickles gives away their used pickle barrels. Oh, that's cool. And so, yeah, make a barrel so, of green barrel. It's all post that on, under this video, too. On our up YouTube. here and on this site, one of the great things about this site is that the different groups that they have here, 
know, they have these different programs. They've done these New Jersey Water Champions. And even at the bottom here, there is usually a link to that Rutgers program we're talking about. Yep, there's the Rutgers Water Resource Program. So what I really like about this site. It's almost a one-stop shop with so many of the tools that just go through the site and start looking at it. We'll include some of them on our own website, but FJDP just did a really good job with this. Why uh, reinvent the wheel? It's a flaw that they did and they use of it. And for the temporary web, I mean, you're telling people not to use water, right? And that's your business. Is it a for-profit or is it a non-for-profit? Like, how is it? So we're a government utility, so we're a non-profit. Okay. Our job is to balance our budget every year with our expenses. You know, I mean, normally expenses go up with inflation, so it, you know, it's always a dream to be able to lower rates, but it's never been the reality for so many systems these last couple of decades. But reality is we don't have uh, an excess. There's nobody making a profit on what we have. We, literally, when we put our budget together, you find our budget on there, we, we put up a chart about our expense requirements and it's the same amount of money of what our budget and what we're expecting to get from our revenues. Right, so it doesn't, it's like if you put out more water and it's cost more, like it doesn't. Oh, that's, yep, that's one of our concerns. It's one of our issues. You know, I mean, the biggest issue, Ridgewood Water and the system we have here is possibly one of the most complex systems in the nation. The wow. amount of wells we have, the topography, it's oh, it's not like New York City where they just get it yep. and come down. Yeah, it's Usually it's a huge down. amount. It's also flat land. Like the hydrodynamics that go into operating our system and the way people pull from those. You know, even in New York City, you probably have almost isolated systems within the building. You know, even what's being delivered there. Right. We don't have that. The differences we have and just the type of businesses we have and then the population density is just unbelievable. Yeah, it's one of the most complex systems you probably find in the nation. Now add in everybody pulling as much water as they do to water their lawns, and that's why we have $140 million invested, you know, $40 million invested in the lead service. The aging infrastructure we're gonna have to look at as we get through this current project. Where does Graydon's water come from? Who's? The Graydon Pond, the Graydon Pool, or the Graydon Pond. Graydon actually has their own wells that they are drawing water from. Underneath it or somewhere else? That they Underneath it, right? Near my park. Near my park. Two wells. Yep. Yeah. 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 But it is all from the same aquifer, so it actually adds back to the idea of making sure the aquifer is strong. Because if it takes centuries for that aquifer water to develop, then It's hard to say with aquifers. It's a water cycle. You know, even from what we're taking in, we're putting it back out there. You know, the real reason to conserve from an environmental standpoint is how much energy intensive it is to treat all that. First, before we deliver it to you, and then before we deliver it back to the system. So, you know, like there's a pretty good cycle, and the DEP understands a little bit about that hydrogeology, so they know how much is going in, and they set limits on what we can take. And it's why we still have water restrictions. You know, uh, uh, Bill Biroz, our superintendent last year, was sweating very hard when we were close to 15 million gallons a day. In the spring last year, we had a huge, um, I don't know if we had a chart for that. Last year, you may remember, we had a very dry spring. So we were pretty much at average all the way up until April. And you started seeing spikes kind of tally out. And then you see right in that June, just before July, huge spike in water. That was around when all those firefighters, uh, the forest fires were happening, that uh, strange, you know, Mars landscape we had for that day. Oh my gosh. You know, and then we got very lucky. We were very close to going to, we were very proud to say we haven't gone to a level three or level three. Uh, four restriction in eight years. This year, we don't have to do it again, it'll be nine years. And really, it's because of all those who have taken the extra steps to be part of our water conservation efforts. But back in 2015, it was, we had to. What does that mean for level three level four? So we have uh, different, our different water restrictions. Uh, essentially, we cut off all lawn water. 
specifically. You know, we have a two-day schedule right now to keep us at a steady state. But when we actually have to, uh, let's see, it should be listed in here. These are actually the ordinances that each of the town has passed in order to uh, set our water rules. Take up Glen Rocks for an example. So here is where uh, we used to have stage one, two, three, four. Last year, all the systems came together and made our the water restrictions, which would have been two-day water restrictions, which would have been stage two, a permanent feature. It's our permanent water schedule now. So we're asking everybody to follow. But if it gets worse, then we got to go to three, four. So three is pending critical. Mandatory restrictions for irrigation on all properties to the use of only handheld hoses on Tuesdays and Sundays, Wednesdays and Sundays, um, and then no irrigation of any kind allowed on Mondays, Thursdays, and Fridays. If I'm, if I'm not mistaken, that's mostly residential as we still follow the um, municipal for those Mondays and Fridays. So the days stay the same, but then you just have to do it with your hand. Machine does so it makes it way harder. Exactly. That's the water. Yeah. You really have to go the effort to do it. Right? And then come critical, all irrigation is prohibited. You know, we to this day we have never shut anybody else off for abusing it. But if, if we have to, we have to because we have to make sure the water's there. And yeah, there's something that people don't really think about. It's we need water services, we need water for all the services. We need to maintain a certain tank level in order to maintain a certain pressure for fire suppression. If we get below that level, there's a fire, and we can't deliver water to the firemen out there trying to do their jobs. That, you know, that's what we're trying to protect when we go to these high levels. It's possible. <laughs> this is possible. Oh, yeah. Because we moved here right after, I guess, in the last time, so we didn't see this. We were very close last year. I think you were in Italy at the time. Uh, Rich was sitting there. <laughs> what? Rich was sitting there. Uh, Phil was sitting there sweating every day. He was sitting there look, looking at those pumps, just getting more and more worried. He was like, I'm gonna pull the trigger. I'm gonna pull the trigger. And then rain came. People stopped watering for a few days. It's all the lawn water. That's the whole. That's the main culprit. It's the whole thing. It's unbelievably that that is it. I mean, like, that's the thing. We, we don't care as much about the recreation activities. Usually, that sparks a few between. Everybody starts watering at the same time. The pull on that system becomes so immense. That's when we have to turn on all of our wells, all of our treatment plants, everything we can do to get water into the system and into the tanks. What do the other towns do? Not the four here, but like the, the other, the other, the Paramus or Washington or Columbus. Do they just have different utilities that service them? Like how does? Uh, Fairlawn is its own utility. Um, some, you know, uh, Hawthorne has its own oh, utility. Park Ridge, Mawa, Allendale. They're all municipal. Oh, they're all individual yes. single town. I see. They're all wells, same as us. It's all the same kind of idea. You know, some have been purchased by other companies. The bills have gone up. But you know, into that. Perhaps the service by the old used to be sewer and water. Mm -hmm. So Ridgewood used to be serviced by sewer. No, Never. Was it always? We have interconnections with Suez and with the Save Valley. So we have options to draw from them if we need to. And actually, it's been part of our PFAS operational strategy is while we're building these constructions, we were able to draw from that. Because they were under the New Jersey limits, but they're not necessarily going to be under the new federal limits that are coming. So that's actually an option that's going to go away until they can get their treatment installed. By then, we should have our treatment installed and maybe they, they may be looking for Get stuff uh, is it like a limiting PFAS? Like if we would it make our water system redundant or for the most part, yes, of course. You know, that's kind of what it's coming down to. So our system is designed to remove down to non-detect levels of PFAS. The PFAS master, master plan that uh, Mount McDonald put together for us back in 2020, the whole design is to make sure that PFAS is non-detected. So even we're right now working to meet the New Jersey limits. The federal government finally puts their limits into place, and it could possibly be as low as four parts per trillion. 
we're going to be set to treat to that level. There's a chart over here. I might have a couple charts back here on CFOS. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to wrap this up at home. Thank yes. you, everybody.